In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here for another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Very nice to be with you here yet again, week after week, bringing you new content straight to your smartphone or desktop or earbuds or however you're listening or viewing our program. I want to welcome you to today's show. I'm very much looking forward to this uh, topic uh, of today's uh, program because uh, we're looking at some Bible backgrounds, some ideological backgrounds, looking at uh, Paul and his... uh, Uh, I don't want to say interaction with, but uh, sort of in dialogue with other, um, well, the giants of philosophy. And so um, we've had some hiccups in starting the program today. Um, We were able to get the other uh, co-editor of the uh, the book on, uh, Joey Dodson. And and let me uh, show this book, great uh, cover by University Press, Paul and the Giants of Philosophy, edited by Joseph Dodson and David Briones, uh, or as they seem to go by, Joey and David, uh, Joey and Dave. Uh, Gentlemen, um, thank you for joining us on our program today. Uh, I want to um, say thanks for your patience in having us get this stuff set up. Uh, Dave, we're glad to have you on the phone, and apologies for any uh, hiccups that we may have had uh, here during uh, the setup process. Um, and uh, before we get rolling, let me let me talk uh, about each of you first. Uh, so uh, Joey is the Associate Professor of New Testament uh, at uh, Denver Seminary, and that's a position you were recently appointed to. Uh, Joey, is that right? This has been your first year uh, at Denver, and um, that's been a, a, you know, I'm sure uh, a fun challenge with all the social stuff going on this spring semester for you, hasn't it? <laughs> it has. And uh, Dave, you are at Westminster uh, Theological Seminary. And um, I, I think um, that place, knowing the ideological um, uh, values there, I, I found you in particular as someone I'd enjoy having a conversation with. Now, um, you guys are... Um, as you mentioned in the book, there's a diversity of opinions here. And um, let me first ask um, maybe just something basic to get us started. Uh, first, how did you guys meet? And what were some of the ideas that you had that brought this book uh, into creation? Joe, you want to go for that one? I don't I honestly that? remember how we met. Uh, <laughs> I'm guessing you were a lowly PhD student at Durham. And maybe DJ or Ben introduced us. Yeah, I, I wish I, I had this right. remarkable story about how he walked in the room and you know all of a sudden lights came on. I just saw the brilliance and had to hide my eyes and he put a mask <laughs> on uh, just to keep me from well, being afraid. I certainly immediately had a man crush on Joey. He's just great character, <laughs> personality, uh, livens up the room. I, I remember basically. It, it was meeting at Durham, but how we started on the project was after a, a, a paper I think I presented on Seneca and in at SBL. And Joey took me aside and just said, hey, do you mind if we just chat more about this? And we shared our love for Seneca. And we wanted to write a book where we co-author a single book looking at Paul and Seneca, because Sevenster's book hadn't mm. been... Uh, it was published in 61, I think. And so um, we thought that that was needed. And over the course of that, those conversations, we decided that it's probably better if we do these other projects leading up to that. And that's kind of how we started with one project, Paul and Seneca and Dialogue, and ultimately um, trying to go more at the popular, popular level with Paul and the Giants of Philosophy. Uh, is that right, Joey? It is, Yeah. So Dave's not only the best looking of us, he's also the smartest. Uh, so I wanted to. So that's why we've kept him off camera for today's show. <laughs> he's just on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So throw yeah. all your hard. Not, not make Joey stumble. <laughs> I, I, yeah, right. I just brought color commentary into Dave's life, but he's the brilliant one among us. Uh, but yeah, I, I had a fascination true. with Seneca, and Dave was actually uh, full time doing Paul and Seneca. A lot of the stuff that John Barclay and Paul and the Gift uh, was working on, uh, Dave was in conversation with John 
during that point. Now, uh, you guys are um, what I would call sort of pure or true academics. Uh, you guys have written academic works. Uh, you've published with some some big name uh, publishers, uh, whether that be uh, you know even in journals, uh, which is some serious stuff. One of the things I appreciate about this book, though, as I've been sort of combing through it, is the accessibility of it. Uh, so it's published by University Press. It's not IVP Academic. The footnotes, while there, are not all that heavy, which means someone like a, a churchgoer or even someone interested in apologetics or New Testament at a very uh, introductory level can um, take this book and... Um, you know, sort of just jump in. It, uh, it, it's a primer uh, on uh, this material. And that's one of the things that I appreciate about the writing style. One of the uh, interests and um, values we ha have here at Veracity Hill is making the content accessible for people so they can understand mm -hmm. this stuff. So to that end, you guys mentioned a guy named Seneca. And some of the, the audience, the listeners might be like, well, yeah, maybe I've heard that name. Maybe it was like a Roman guy or something like that. Um, tell me, who was Seneca, uh, why is he important, and what, it, what interests you guys uh, in having read and learned about Seneca and the relationship to Paul there? And we've got a bunch of other names of folks from the ancient time that we'll, we'll be talking about as well on today's show. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I can let Joey, Joey go first. He has one thing when we first met that became apparent upon our first meeting was um, a deep level of respect for Seneca in particular that Joey had. So I'll let him go first. Right. Well, I had only seen cross references to Seneca in a lot of commentaries during my graduate school program. And I had found another parallel that I wanted to chase down in the library, Seneca's on anger, an essay that he wrote. And I went and I opened it up and I spent the rest of the day just reading Seneca because it was just so uh, powerful, poignant and, and exciting. Uh, but Seneca was born around the time of Jesus, uh, and uh, he actually spent some time in Egypt. Perhaps they were in Egypt at the same time. Uh, his dad was a politician. His brother, uh, Gamaliel, uh, sorry, um, Gallio was a politician. He actually occurs in Acts. Um, he's the one who judicates on behalf of Paul, uh, but uh, was a Roman senator and Roman philosopher, the most prolific of the Roman Stoics. Most of us think of Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius. Uh, when we think of the Roman Stoics, but Seneca was much more prolific. And, you know, Marcus Aurelius, he's kind of like the pop star. You know, he's like the Taylor Swift <laughs> of Roman Stoicism. But uh, <laughs> Seneca has, has, has a lot more depth, um, and uh, he, he, he has essays and he has letters. And I spent most of my time in the letters. But, Dave, you want to add to that? Let me pass it over to you. Yeah, no, I, I, remember, I remember when he would, you would text me portions of Seneca's letters and just absolutely enthralled lot of material, and it kind of only motivated me to read more of Seneca um, as others' writings, because during my PhD, that's when I began to, uh, I worked with John Barclay, and he just recommended looking at Seneca's understanding of gift-giving in particular. Before that time, I'd only seen cross-references in books as well, in background books in particular, but then opening up the book uh, on benefits, um, it's, it's a, it's a gift-giving treatise. And the major work in the first century, and again, as Joey mentioned, he's contemporaneous with Paul. And so for me, it was just fascinating to see someone who wrote the same time as Paul talking about gifts and gift giving and connecting that with Paul's understanding of grace. And that's, that's, that was my whole uh, focus in the, during the PhD was to consider how grace is considered a gift and how ancients thought about gift giving. And so for me, I, I spent a long time just comparing Paul and Seneca, um, and that's kind of uh, what, what drew me to him and what ultimately helped me to appreciate a lot of things that he said, not just in my comparison to Paul, but actually uh, just in everyday life. There was just a lot of good advice that I found in Seneca, and that didn't trump my commitment to Scripture, but Scripture um, doesn't provide everything on every topic. Mm. And I thought that Seneca was just a really helpful, uh, helpful way to, to complement my understanding of gifts as a Christian. Dave, let me, if I can follow you up there, um, and this might be a slight uh, tangent of source, but we'll work our way back. 
Um, you talked about yep. um, analyzing gift giving and analyzing Paul's thought of grace. Have you come across Matthew Bates' work on salvation by allegiance alone? Uh, because he talks about that as well, the uh, the principle of reciprocity uh, and how that existed in the ancient times. And I'm curious, um, you know, if so first, have you come across his work? And second, what do you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so I have I have to admit I have not read it cover to cover. Um, I've dipped into it and I've read lots of people interact with it. Those who ap- appreciate a lot of what he says. Um, and those who would challenge a lot of what he says, especially his perspective on faith and what, how, how he would define faith. Um, wh- if we're talking about reciprocity, do you, would you give me maybe something that you have in mind concerning reciprocity, and then maybe I could respond that way? Yeah, well, he's he, he'd be more the expert on it. Um, I'd have to go back and probably listen to my interview. <laughs> I just like no. ask, asking the questions more than anything else. But yeah, something. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm sorry to turn it back on you. <laughs> no, no, no. But but maybe something like this. So suppose like, um, um, well, there are people that hold to sort of the free grace concept. Um, right. And and really what um, among other targets, I think that Bates has in mind is that uh, uh, there's there's something that we have to give back, you know, Um Yes, it's yeah. a, it's a gift, but you know it's not it's not so easy. It's not easy believing uh, believing isn't yeah, or isn't that right. the, the pop term. Uh, so there's just there's more to it than that. And I'm sure he's got d- detractors and other scholars. And I think people are worried about his views on justification that follow from that. But well, heavens, we yeah, could do a whole course. episode and, and discussion on that. <laughs> um, all right, so let's let's That's true. let's track back here. So uh, Paul and the giants of philosophy. Um, so you guys have been big Seneca fans. Um, what are some names of other um, Greco-Roman thinkers that um, Paul may have been familiar with? Uh, you know, there's not a, a, a rabbit trail, so we don't know, or, or I mean a paper trail, uh, so we don't know exactly. He does quote some philosophers uh, in the book of Acts, uh, but what are some names of mm-hmm. other folks and how they may or may not have influenced uh, Paul, or if he was just confrontational against them? Do we take this one first? Oh, yeah, go for it. Go for yeah, it. Uh, I'll, I'll start out and I'll let you finish. I, I would say that uh, Paul grow, growing up in Tarsus, uh, that would kind of be like an Ivy League city. Uh, we're not positive yeah. how much education Paul got, uh, but s- some of his understanding of the philosophers possibly came from his pro gymnasium, if he had that education in Tarsus. Some may have come from graffiti, uh, just like we might have uh, someone gro- graffiti YOLO. Uh, they may have a graffiti, everything in moder- <laughs> moderation. Uh, and then some just from surrounding the, the ph- philosophical teachers, like what we see uh, of the sophists in First Corinthians, where Paul uh, gives us these philosophical terms and then turns them over on their head. Uh, one thing that we should understand is that uh, when I was in high school, my uh, civics teacher, Mr. Gilmore, made a passing comment on how Socrates was kind of like the Jesus for the Greeks and the Republic was like their Bible. And I didn't know enough about either at that point to question whether he was right or wrong. Uh, but Socrates, Plato, Aristotle was so influential uh, especially in a mixed culture like what we see in Tarsus. And uh, the question we have to have beyond that is not just which philosophers did he know directly, but which philosophers had influenced the Judaism, of which Paul was an heir. Mm. Um, so mm. how much of this, um, uh, you know, whereas Dave, who's uh, he's asked uh, John Calvin into his heart to be his personal Lord and Savior, uh, Dave can't look back at the New <laughs> Testament. Or, it's difficult it's difficult for him to look back in the New Testament without looking through Reformation lenses. Uh, so also it would be mm. difficult for Paul to look uh, back at the Old Testament without Second Temple literature lenses uh, that had been greatly influenced by these philosophers. And so uh, the question is how much influence uh, with these people? Is it direct from his schooling or is it something that he's drinking out of the Second Temple literature uh, water, um, if you will? Dave, I'll, I'll pass mm-hmm. it on to you from there. Well, well, yeah. I mean, there's. I, I would say amen to everything you said, except for um, asking John Calvin into my heart. <laughs> 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 Just wouldn't want to put him on the same level as Jesus. But um, I, I would say, I would say, uh, definitely, we we don't quite know all of that information, and I think that's kind of the the joy of what we did in our methodology. 
our, our methodology that undergirds both Paul and Seneca in dialogue and Paul and the Giants of philosophy is to place these philosophers and their ideologies into, into a dialogue with the Apostle Paul, um, which, which made it just absolutely stimulating to read these guys, like Aristotle, for example, reading Nicomachean Ethics in one hand and the Bible in the other on the same topic, and trying to avoid, you know, parallelomania, that just because Aristotle uses one word and Paul does, then they obviously meant the same thing. Um, mm. but, but thinking more critically and doing better historical work as well, uh, that just led to asking questions of Paul that hadn't been asked before, or maybe have been asked, but maybe perhaps overlooked, depending on the context. Uh, and so it, it was really great to see some of these other contributors as well asking questions I never would have thought to have asked um, based on the text that they were comparing, uh, whatever philosopher it was. So I just I thought that was really quite interesting in, our, um, in the process of writing the book. Dave, I, I know we've only got you on maybe for a, a portion of the program today. So I, I want to ask um, a sort of a follow-up there. I use the term confrontational and... Um, and, and please correct me if anything I am about to say and ask is inaccurate. But so you're at Westminster and there the presuppositional apologetics is, is large. You, you are um, I think you're part of an OPC church. My mm-hmm. reading of uh, other um, uh, presuppositionalist uh, apologists is they interpret Paul as very much confrontational to uh, external uh, schools of thought. And is that is that something that you are sympathetic to? Uh, I know that there are a diversity of, of views in in the book here. Um, is that something you hold, or is there uh, is there more of an openness that you might have to seeing how Paul may have learned or appreciated uh, other not even non Christian perspectives? Yeah, that's a great question, and and that would be. That would be accurate. Um, Paul was confrontational. I, what I find to be interesting is um, the different emphases that Joey and I had during the process of talking about Paul and Seneca. Um, and Joey, you can jump in anytime here too. I think the the one thing that we kept going back and forth on when we talked about methodology is is whether or not Paul is confronting. Um, it, and, and if so, how much? I think we both agree that that Paul is confronting the world with the gospel, and the gospel is utterly unique, not found in any other um, Greco-Roman writing. Uh, and, and so when you're comparing Seneca and Paul, um, ultimately, you're going to have um, some level of confrontation. I think the question is, how much? And so... Um, this is a huge topic. You know, Kevin Rowe has written a book. Other, other scholars have written books on basically that question. Are they rival traditions? Is there more overlap than there is um, rivalry? Uh, but at the end of the day, from my perspective, um, I, am, I, would, I would hold to presuppositional apologetics. I mean, within that, you have soft and hard presuppositionalists. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, convinced that when Paul enters into um, or brings the gospel, this divine gospel, into this world, that it necessarily confronts uh, every single notion of salvation, um, because it is the one and true living God who has communicated the way um, to him through his son, Jesus. And so when I, when I see similarity I can appreciate similarities, like Paul and Seneca talk about grace or gift or anything like, or, or Aristotle and Paul talk about friendship and use similar terms to describe friendship, like the same soul, you know, in Philippians 1 and then and beginning in Philippians 2. Very similar language that's used by Aristotle and Aristotle's writing in the Greek, and they use the same terms, koinos or koinos and koinonia, fellowship. Um, so I can appreciate those similarities. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm I'm going to see more discontinuity than continuity, and it doesn't render the comparison superficial. It's not like I'm simply putting up Aristotle and Paul together to talk about friendship so that I can magnify Paul. But it just happens at the end of the day, 
And it may go back to one's presupposition, much like Joey said, I can't read the New Testament without reformational lenses, which is, which is true. Um, but at, this, at the same time, when you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you see scriptures and you, you have the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit that tells you this is the Word of God, then, of course, what's going to stand out most in the comparative project is that Paul's gospel is utterly unique. And so I think that's that's what I would say in response. But, um, yeah. Joey, do you have boxing gloves, and are you ready to have a, a counter position to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have a little bit more charitable orthodoxy than Dave when it comes to these philosophers. Uh, but one thing that we see is that there are, definitely are times where the gospel says, wrong, wrong, that is wrong. And so in uh, Plato's Republic and the Myth of Air, at the end, of a thousand years uh, of punishment or bliss, there's reincarnation. And of course, Paul would say, no, that's absolutely wrong. Uh, There are other times where it it may be that it's right, like what we see in Acts chapter 17, where Paul's going to quote them and say, yeah, they're exactly right. Uh, And then I think more so than not, it's somewhere in the middle where Paul will say, yes, but there's so much more. Uh, and, and we see this not just with the philosophers, but we see this with the Old Testament. I mean, there are times where obviously Paul is going to quote the Old Testament. As a father of five, I love um, his quotation. I think Paul wrote Ephesians. Uh, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, man. Just want, <sighs> I, I love it. And so there are times where he just will quote the Old Testament and the law itself. There's other times where he'll put his gospel uh, seemingly over against. Uh, so like in Romans 10, uh, Leviticus 18, 5b says the righteous will live in these things, but the righteous are by faith. And then he goes on to quote uh, Deuteronomy 30. And so, uh, but, but what happens more so than either of those extremes is Paul taking this Old Testament thing and now uh, looking at it in light of how much fuller it is uh, with respect to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, C- uh, Seneca talks about how the Epicureans, they were kind of the bad guys, the, their rivals. They were the uh, cardinals to their cubs since you're a Cubs fan, Kurt, uh, he talks about, yeah, like every once in a while, you'll get a drip of uh, good stuff from the Epicureans. But with the Stoics, our truth is always on tap and it's always flowing. And, and so I, I think some, something like that with Paul, where, yeah, you might can get a drip uh, here and there from the philosophers, but that drip is to whet your appetite for what the gospel has to share. Lewis uh, uses the picture of a candlelight uh, so the, the, these Greco Roman philosophers in Allegory of Love, he talks about this. They they had like truth with respect with respect to a wick, uh, but that truth was obviously greatly eclipsed once they saw the sunrise, Jesus Christ. Mm. Uh, Dave, Ooh. again, I, I think I know you might be uh, parting ways with us at the break, so we've just got a few more minutes before we do that. So let me ask you: um, you contributed two chapters uh, in the book here, and what what was your hope in? Uh, penning uh, those two essays. Yeah. Um, well, well, Joey, we'll have to carry on this conversation because uh, you, you spurred on some really good thoughts. Um, <laughs> but we can do that some other time. Um, but I, I would say, um, you know, what, what spurred on those chapters and what I hope to achieve, that, that's the question. Um, I, I would say, you know, you, you described this as as academics, and I think both Joey and I would say that uh, we're churchmen who happen to be academics, yeah. um, or some some version of that. We just love the church, and we want to help the church to understand the scriptures. And so, for me in particular, I wanted the I wanted the uh, the church and and even pastors to understand the nature of biblical biblical understanding of gift giving um, and friendship, but also to appreciate. Some of these sources that do communicate uh, some level of truth. I mean, having the sense of the divine and being able to say, you know, basically um, with Augustine that we can plunder the Egyptians. You know, and we can we can draw on what some of these philosophers had shown us and use them um, for the greater purpose of communicating God's word to God's people. And so that's that was mainly my intent in wanting to write that. Uh, that they would have a, a better understanding of friendship and gift giving with the sole purpose of of enhancing relationships in the church. 
Nice, good. All right, well, hey, we've got to take our break here. Um, Dave, it, thank you for uh, carving time out of your, your schedule there. I know you've uh, been preoccupied with another matter, um, but I, I, thanks for stepping aside there for some time. And uh, wonderful to have you on the program. Thank you for your work uh, in, in writing those essays and editing this book. I think it's going to be very important for uh, folks. And certainly I want to encourage uh, people interested in New Testament studies and apologetics, uh, philosophy of religion, to pick up this book, uh, Paul and the Giants of Philosophy. Uh, so in the second half of the program, we'll keep chatting with Joey, learning more about these uh, Greco-Roman philosophers. And uh, I've got a few more questions for him on, on those folks as well. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Let's say there's this Christian apologist. You love their message, but have trouble finding their videos, their articles, or social media posts. How do you stay connected to them? We're on it. Defenders Media uses the tools of the digital age to create content for your favorite apologists. We give them more screen time, more digital soapboxes, and more presence to deliver more of the content that you love. That's what we do. I know that social media is important to those of you who follow my work. Many respond to my videos and posts on Facebook and Twitter. But it becomes impossible after a while to keep up with it all and to continue with research. That's why I'm thrilled that we have found a solution, Defenders Media. Whether it's a website, whether it's printed material, whether it's a question on graphics, I cannot do what I do and reach my audience without the help of Defenders Media. They have been integral in helping me to reach my audience. Defenders Media ensures consistent content reaches your hand from today's leading apologists and apologetic ministries, like Mike Lycona, Apologetics 315, the Veracity Hill Podcast with Kurt Jarris, and more. To learn more, text the word DEFENDERS to 555-888, and we'll send you a free PDF of the top five ways to share the gospel online. Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, you can go to our website, veracityhill.com, click on that Sponsor tab. We'd love to get your support uh, for the program. love to advertise your uh, uh, organization. If you're an author, perhaps a book, uh, your business, a number of different ways uh, and different sponsorship levels, be sure to check that out. And also, uh, if you uh, would love to contribute to the ministry of Veracity Hill, you can do so by uh, going to our website. And our uh, donors are so important to help keep the... Po- program going and growing. And uh, let me say this, maybe it's weird for me to say this because the future of Veracity Hill is a bit uncertain. Um, and uh, I've accepted a position at Faith Ascent Ministries in St. Louis. So whether or not Veracity Hill, uh, new episodes will keep coming is uh, uh, an unknown. However, the ministry continues on because we will have 200 interviews, generally speaking, full of material and content that we want to keep sharing with people, and we can't do it without your support, so continue supporting us. Uh, Our uh, now single guest uh, on the program, uh, Joey Dodson, he said uh, in the first half that his favorite uh, verse Paul quotes from the Old Testament is, uh, the uh, children obey your parents in the Lord. And uh, my favorite uh, verse, Joey, is on um, um, don't muzzle an ox. And uh, so, you know, when, when people are fundraising, I like to use that one. That's, he's quoting the Old Testament, don't muzzle an ox, um, but he gives it a whole new different meaning, <laughs> a secondary meaning. Uh, so it's, it's fun to see how authors uh, do that. Um, okay, now before we're jumping back to our program, um, Chris, do we have um, 
We do not. Okay, no. Maybe next week we'll have a segment for what's behind Kurt. Okay, uh, good. Well, Joy, we do have a segment for you called Rapid Questions. And uh, it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a short segment. It's 60 questions. It's totally unrelated to our discussion today. And, um, and this would have been hard to do with two people. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's good. We've got you, just you now on the line. I'm going to get the audio up here. Um, and so, uh, okay, 60 seconds. Try to answer as many as you can, quickly as you can. We'll get to learn a little bit more about you. So are you ready? Yes. Okay, he's done his warm-ups here. Here we go. Mm-hmm. KFC or Taco Bell? I'm vegan, so Taco Bell. Uh, clothing store of choice? Uh, H&M. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Fight Club. Morning person or a night owl? Morning, morning, morning. Uh, what's your biggest phobia? Being humiliated on a podcast. Um, okay, here's one. What's your favorite smell? <laughs> Uh, vanilla. Marvel or DC? DC. Superman, baby. What was the name of your first pet? Uh, Bilbo. As in Bilbo Baggins. Pick a fictional character you'd like to meet. Uh, Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> first movie you went on a date to? Woo! Uh, let's see. Gosh. Um, maybe Purple Rain. Uh, Prince. If you had to sing karaoke, what song would you pick? Uh, it's Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd. Okay, nice. I'm not sure I've heard that one. Um, yeah, we don't need no education. Oh, yes, of course, yeah, of course. I find it ironic being a professor that, yeah. That's right. We don't need no education. Yeah, funny. Okay, Bilbo Baggins. Uh, why would you want to meet him? Because uh, I'd love to be in uh, Middle Earth. Uh, so I've had a fascination with Tolkien all my life. So my Instagram, my Twitter, it's all J.R.R. Dotson because of my oh. homage to Tolkien. I see. Interesting. And now is your middle initial R? Um, it is. That's so right. You just yeah, threw so. in an additional R? Well, I'm actually a junior. So I, I pulled the junior up to the front. So I got the junior R. Dotson. But... Yeah, basically, it's an added R for the sake of Tolkien. Gotcha. Uh, my son that was born in Scotland, he is IRR, Ian Roman Richard Dodson. So he's carrying on the legacy. Very nice. Oh, neat. Good. Okay, uh, jumping back to our topic of discussion, we're talking about Paul and the Giants of Philosophy. Um, now, we, um, um, well, Mark Viewing here says, yes, Fight Club. Uh, I guess that's one of his favorites as well. Uh, <laughs> So we've talked about Seneca, uh, but there are, uh, and you've brought up some other ones, uh, Aristotle, I think Epictetus maybe was mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, let's run through the list. I mean, who are these other giants? Maybe we've heard of Plato and Socrates, but there are some other ones that I think people have never even heard of. Yeah. Uh, so, well, let's start with Socrates, going back to him being kind of the Jesus of the uh, Greeks. If that was the case, then Plato would kind of be like the John, the beloved disciple, and I think Aristotle would be similar to the Paul, uh, where you have more of the theology that, that would go from that. And uh, it, in a sense, uh, you have all of these other denominations, if you will, that break off uh, from these uh, scholars. Um, the Epictetus one that you mentioned, uh, he's going to be part of that Roman Stoic. Um, he's very popular because he actually wrote in Koine Greek. So if you have any uh, students uh, that are listening to this podcast that know Koine, they actually can read that we mentioned Marcus Aurelius as well, and so uh, those are kind of the Roman Stoics uh, that's there. Uh, Cicero comes into play. Cicero would, in a sense, be the Plato or Aristotle uh, for the Romans. Uh, he wrote his own Republic, and I bring that one up in mine. Uh, Philodemus uh, was a philosopher uh, who deals a lot uh, with suffering, therapy for the weak. And I'm trying to remember uh, some of the others that, that were there. But we focus mostly on the giants of philosophy, so the bigger of the names. And you do have a couple of the more obscure ones that filter in there just because of the nature of the project. Mm, right. So one of those, uh, Aratus, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is who Paul quotes in Acts. Right. Right. So my interest in apologetics, Mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, I, I, you know, I see that there. Acts 17, very apologetic oriented. Of course, there are different interpretations on how to uh, understand Paul there. But, you know, I I think it's neat. My own view is that um, he's drawing, he's found um, 
And again, I, I know Dave would certainly disagree with me on this. I think <laughs> he's found common ground uh, between the two camps yeah. and he's using that mm -hmm. to, to pull people over. Uh, so that's sort of how I, I read that passage. Um, yeah. Uh, well, on that passage, just that uh, goes back to that conversation here. Luke presents Paul as a new Socrates. And so just like Socrates had introduced the new gods, um, uh, here Paul is introducing new gods according to them, Jesus Christ and resurrection. Okay. He appears before the Sanhedrin, and uh, even his very first statement uh, echoes the apology of Socrates. And so uh, that question of him being a spermologos, um, and I forget how our English translations do this, but babbler or Starbucks philosopher, uh, the armchair theologian, yeah. uh, is is this an, an indictment to him that he goes on to show them? Actually, uh, I, I can pick up anything that you're putting down, or is that supposed to be uh, faithful to Paul as being one who kind of picks seeds here and there but doesn't have any formal training? So this is interesting to me. So you've, um, uh, you've said that Luke sort of portrays him as a Socrates, um, mm -hmm. and that's – so that, that can get into all sorts of uh, hermeneutical questions. Uh, and I think there may be some people that are worried about how to uh, understand the book of Acts as a historical work. Some people may want to read it very rigidly. Um, yeah. So much so as if as if there is, you know, an audio recording of uh, Stephen's speech before the Sanhedrin or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that, that's just not the way it was, folks. Um, <laughs> so certainly what we have, I want to say, is a faithful representation of the speeches that were provided. Um, but it would be impossible unless someone was, um, oh, what's that crazy? There are like only so few people uh, in the human race that can literally remember everything that they hear. Uh, so unless Luke had that ability, but even then he wasn't even physically at those locations. So there are certain obstacles facing that view. Um, but so in some respect, Luke as an author um, took some liberties, we might say, in how he conveyed Paul. Is that a fair assessment or am I, am I causing trouble already? Not, not with me. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that we look at Luke uh, and Acts in, with respect to ancient historiography. And the three rules of ancient historiography is a lot different than our post-enlightenment uh, understanding of what history is. Uh, human, and so on and so forth. But kind of three pillars of that is that it had to be true, uh, true and trustworthy. And so when Luke does this, when he writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it is totally true. Uh, second thing is that it had to be entertaining. And so we see that Luke adds some very entertaining irony, sarcasm that's there, uh, whereas our history is more just the facts, just the details. Uh, we don't want any flowery. We want it to, to be uh, just, just very vanilla, if you will. Uh, and, and the third one is that um, uh, that it had to be uh, useful, so practical. Uh, and so here we see uh, him using it for a purpose. But with that entertainment aspect, they did have what we would call liberty um, or artistic, uh, uh, what, what is the phrase, uh, artistic license. Uh, for them, that wasn't artistic license. That's just how you did history. Uh, those who have been following my, my podcast uh, for a while and some of my writings know I'm, I'm supportive of this view. And, um, you know, so, but of course this could, cr could create some troubles, like what precisely is historical and what precisely is license. And that's part of the challenge. Um, I just did, uh, uh, we just released the last episode of the Risen Jesus podcast, uh, with, with Mike Lacona and, um, season four, episode seven, we talk about sort of the historical fog and, sort of Mike's view, I'm sort of the, the Robin to his Batman on that program. Um, <laughs> his, his view is basically, well, it depends. Maybe there are some things that are really crystal clear that are historical in nature and other things which aren't. And that's just the reality. I mean, we have to operate on, you know, what we can know about these ancient people, these ancient times, these ancient documents. So we're just dealing with the best that we can get. So for me, when, when you say that, you know, Luke took the, this license, I might think something, you know, funny. You said it has to be entertaining. You know, the, the fellow who falls out of the window. Um, Eutychus. You know, why is he falling out of the window? Uh, well, yeah. he, some might say he fell asleep. He was bored. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, sort of a detriment to, uh, to Paul's uh, speaking, maybe. <laughs> and, and of course... And there, yeah, Eutychus means lucky. 
you uh, is the good and Tukas is luck. So See? good luck is his name. So I learned something new. Yeah, look at that. There's, there's humor all around it. Yeah, well, and again, scholars have different views on this. And so whether some want to call that into historical question or not, or even if it actually happened, there's still this significant meaning behind it that, that Luke is crafting. So it's not a, a detriment, certainly, to the reliability of the text by any means. Um, but that's part of the, uh, the enjoyment, the pursuit of determining, what's Luke doing here? How does, why does he present Paul in this way? Uh, and that's fascinating how you've connected at least those dots, um, that he's, he's the new Socrates of sorts. So um, tell me more about how um, Paul, uh, how we can place Paul in dialogue uh, with others. I got to be careful how I craft that because, correct me if I'm wrong, to our knowledge, there's no interaction. Um, Seneca lived in the first century, but they probably didn't know each other, Paul and Seneca. Is that fair? Um, yeah. Well, according to church tradition, they actually met. So if you remember, uh, Nero actually. Uh, makes Seneca commit to uh, execute himself, commit suicide. Uh, and so what we have very early on is early church fathers making this reference to our Seneca. Hmm. And Seneca was listed among the Christians as martyrs. Um, and there was uh, reports that Seneca and Paul wrote letters back and forth to one another, but none of those are extant. We do have letters that were written from Seneca and Paul that date back to the, mid the mid middle, middle Ages um, that are forgeries. Uh, but, um, yeah, so I, I don't think that they ever met, uh, but uh, because they were, Paul met his brother, Seneca seemed to have some anti-Semitism uh, mm -hmm. among, like many of the Gentiles during that time. But So we have nothing exact um, that they've met, um, but there has been, uh, whether it's fertile imaginations or uh, truth uh, to it, that uh, they, may, they may have brushed shoulders. Uh, some traditions, some, ch some church traditions are good. Uh, some are kind of like, meh, and others are like, oh yeah, uh, uh, St. Patrick of Ireland took, took out all the snakes and then he traveled to the United States, you know, and I'm just like, meh, that's not a good tradition. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, so, whether or not. But, uh, yeah. The, the point is that, uh, our early church fathers, uh, Christian thinkers, uh, from very beginning saw a lot of, uh, great comparisons between Paul and Seneca. Now, you've written a chapter here, um, and, and I love how aptly um, pop-level you guys worked on titling the, the chapters here. So your chapter is called Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Uh, tell me what's that about and what got you interested in, in that topic. Sure. Well, I'm also interested in uh, apocalyptic eschatology. So when it comes to readings of Paul, I lean more towards apocalyptic Paul. And uh, often what happens is when we think apocalyptic eschatology, and rightfully so, we think of kind of the Jewish background. And so when Paul is apocalyptic, uh, he's showing his Jewish underwear, if you will, his uh, Hebrew boxers. Uh, but what we find out is that um, apocalyptic eschatology is also in Greco-Roman philosophy. And so uh, you have to, of course, what do we mean by apocalyptic? Uh, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, but with respect to apocalyptic in the sense that, that, that there's an afterlife, um, I looked at uh, two of kind of the Deuteronomies, if you will, of the Greeks and of the Romans, that is Plato's Republic and uh, Cicero's Republic. Uh, so this is their magnum opus. Uh, that they, They're wanting us to understand what is it going to take to help us reach uh, the golden age. And in both of these, they actually end with this apocalyptic element. Uh, Plato ends with uh, the myth of Air. This dude named Air dies, uh, and uh, he goes to the afterlife. Of, he sees these guardians that are separating the righteous from the unrighteous to the right and to the left, like sheep and goats. Um, the unrighteous go down to Hades, where they're tortured for a thousand years. Uh, the righteous go to heaven, where they party on the rooftop, top of the world, uh, for a thousand years. After that thousand years, they come back. Um, but but here you have, um, and in the air, he gets to watch this. He doesn't have to participate. And so he sees this happening, and right before they set him on fire, on the pyre, he wakes up, and he is able to report that. And so it was interesting that both of these Greco-Roman philosophers end with this supernatural eschatological note. Uh, with uh, Cicero, it's not uh, the myth of air or the story of air, but instead it's the dream of Scipio. And so Scipio has this vision where he's caught up into the heavens. Uh, he sees the throne room of God, and he wants to stay there. He wants to stay there, but they say, no, 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 you got to go back and serve the state. Uh, and then 
if you serve the state well, then you can come and live here forever. And so I wanted to just look at Paul's understanding of being caught up to the third heaven in Second Corinthians and the understanding of uh, the, the afterlife uh, with respect to uh, these two major uh, tomes in the first century. Uh, so, um, yes, this, this could open up a can of worms on, like, you know, how to interpret Revelation, that sort of thing. Now, I, I know that's not Paul, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. in, ter- yeah. in terms of understanding the apocalyptic genre, there's been mm-hmm. a host of debating on how to do that. And I think um, the church over the past even 20 years has made some vast improvements um, mm. I've, I've always, uh, explained it to people like this. Uh, if you've, you've ever seen the movie Return of the King or you've read the Lord of the Rings, you're a big Tolkien fan. Um, yeah. uh, Gandalf is there, um, at, uh, Minas Tirith. Uh, he's talking with, um, Pippin, right? I always get those guys and confused. Sam, Sam and, Sam and Pippin. Um, uh, well, so. Or just Pippin. The, just said Pippin there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. as the, uh, the armies of Mordor are, uh, entering, and he, he describes what um, the faraway land is like, you know, white shores and uh, calm pastures. And like to me, that's there you go. That, that's apocalyptic, but eschatological language um, about the time that's to come. And um, yeah, we can use lofty language. Uh, I feel uh, maybe I'm going on a, a tangent here, but at any rate, so but so what's important is you see this sort of material in non-Christian sources as well, like you just described, and sometimes you get these big, huge supernatural events, and you get the the fire and brimstone even, um, and so there is a uh, you know it's interesting to see how this is not exclusively Christian attempts to. Uh, understand the end. Um, and furthermore, there are other people that have tried to understand the right way of living uh, to determine what's true. Um, so with these philosophers, you know, you, you get these different worldviews. And um, some of them are obviously, as we talked about, you know, very wrong, in some ways very, very wrong. And But others you are kind of like, oh, yes, so close. You've almost got it. Let me tell you more about what you're you're going on, uh, and so it's uh, it's fascinating to see that and an opportunity for us to uh, to do that in our everyday life. So, tell me, how is it that we can take uh, these authors and apply it to our conversations today? Good. Uh, going back to it with the methodology, what we wanted to do is put Plato and Cicero and Paul around the same podcast or put them in Starbucks, all drinking coffee and talking about these things and look at the similarities and the differences and the similar similarities actually enhance the differences. And so uh, one thing that we see with Plato and with uh, Cicero is that each one of these guys who are caught up to the third heavens, who are caught up to the heavens or whatever it may be, they have uh, this mediator to explain, to teach them things. But Paul doesn't mention any mediator. Uh, and uh, the heir and Scipio they're, they're supposed to go back and tell what they've seen in order to validate to, to give validity to what they're saying. But Paul comes back and says, I, I can't tell you, uh, but you, you wouldn't get it. Uh, and so looking at those similarities and putting Paul in this context, we see that most likely these super apostles that he's talking about are going to be leaning towards a Cicero or Plato type understanding. Uh, but Paul doesn't come and say, hey, I don't need your miracles. Instead, I don't have to be called to the third heaven to uh, to affirm me, to validate me, because Jesus Christ was caught up to heaven. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Um, And I don't need uh, your great boasting, because instead I have the grace of God in the midst of suffering. And so uh, what happens, uh, methodology, is I think we can use this within the church to uh, put the Christian gospel uh, in conversation with uh, these rival traditions or philosophical traditions, because they help us see things that we wouldn't look at uh, if we're just looking at everything uh, that that agrees with us, and mm. so part of education is comparing and contrasting, uh, again for the sake of us uh, understanding what we believe even more uh, more solid. Yeah, yeah, it it brings clarity. Um, mm-hmm. Hey, this is this is our view, and here's another view. Let's take a look at it, and don't I mean 
don't feel insecure. I think some Christians, they feel just insecure about exploring other views. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. no, that's not, I mean, so our tagline here is striving for truth uh, on subject matters. Uh, but so that's, you know, we shouldn't be fearful of exploring the positions of other people and, and in some cases doing so with an openness um, because mm-hmm. we might be wrong about something on some particular issue. And so it's good to foster those. I think one of the things we've lost in American society is the ability to talk about, um, well, religion and politics. You know, they, I was mm-hmm. told that as a, as a kid by, by my teachers, not my parents, my teachers, don't talk about religion and politics, you know. I was like, well, wait a second. Mm-hmm. Those are the two most important things in life. Uh, we should be talking about this stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I never resonated with that philosophy and as some people at my church and my friends know, I'm always keen to talk about controversial things that others might not explore in discussion. Uh, Joey, we've got a question from one of our, our viewers. Uh, Robert's asking, uh, where do you make the distinction between accepta- acceptable liberties? So we were talking about uh, literary license, acceptable mm-hmm. liberties in cultural genre and divinely inspired texts. So where's that distinction? Yeah, very good. Well, I think the divinely inspired text is what is the base. It's the foundation. And so the reason that I don't have to be afraid, the reason I don't panic when I come to this point, is that I understand that this is truth because of the Spirit of God inspiring Luke. And so that that would be the basis of it. And then with that basis of inspiration, I understand that God uh, allowed Luke to use the vocabulary to use the the way that he does history, the the way that he reasons. And so just like Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, um, I believe that Acts is fully God. It's fully divinely inspired, but it's also fully man uh, in the sense that Luke is able to use uh, his skills of the day, his his teaching, and even the way that he sets it up is like an ancient history. And so he's playing the rules that uh, has been given to him. It's like uh, playing soccer. Uh, but he has a spirit of God that is empowering him to do that. And so he's not going to full out tackle or drop kick someone uh, in soccer because those are not the rules. And so he's using the rules of ancient historiography. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about with that is uh, uh, there's ancient historiography and there's Jewish ancient histor- historiography. And a lot of what uh, Luke is doing looks more like kind of the Jewish version of that, more so than what we might see in Plutarch or so forth. I, I do think it's fascinating that in the Old Testament, we see more rigid historical work being performed. Um, for example, Chronicles. I mean, I think it's one of the far on the rigid end of like just, you know, black and white. Here's what happened. Then this happened. Then this happened. And we see uh, historical narrative uh, at maybe a step away from that. Um, but it's not, then this happened, then this happened. It's not so dry, right? There's a story being told. And how the story is told, even in the Old Testament, you know, there's uh, some events are chosen, other events are not. Um, and then as we move on, we see uh, other forms of the genre of history develop. Uh, like you talked about earlier, Joey, it had to be entertaining. It had to be engaging. Otherwise, it would be dull and boring, and people would go do something else instead of listening to the story. So I think that's a good question by Robert, but at the same time— Yeah, thank you, Robert. I, I just—I don't think we need to really separate them. We need to just say, oh, look, no, they are one and the same. But the question is, which instances apply and which ones uh, do not uh, so Robert does have a follow-up here, which is a, is a good follow-up. He, he's curious about uh, the permissibility of inventing details in a story. And as some people familiar in, in the scholarship, like yourself, may know, there are some scholars who think wholesale passages and events were invented. So where do we then draw that line on, uh, on that, and uh, if we do? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know exactly where I draw a line, but uh, one thing that we know about Luke is that he has a history aspect. Um, you know, he, he takes this, like what he says in the beginning of Luke, is I've come to write you one that is mo better, uh, you know, that um, is mo- more acrobose, if you will. And so he tells us details like uh, with Mary, uh, how she felt. And so I don't think that Luke is, oh, I bet she felt like this. I think he actually went and interviewed her. Mm. And so uh, it, it may be that later on he went and talked to Paul about uh what happened when Paul was in Athens and some of those details that come in. Uh, and yeah, so there's a lot of different rules of ancient historiography. And I would just say that 
uh, the more we understand those, the less we have to panic uh, with respect to those details or just a lot of things that we don't know. What do you hope people take away from the book? Sorry, can you ask uh, that again? Yeah. Uh, what do you hope people will take away from uh, reading the book? Good. Yeah. So, you know, Socrates, he talks about how he has no truth of himself. He's like a midwife and he's there to deliver the truth from other people. Uh, that's what we've done. We've gotten an all-star cast of these students uh, from top PhD programs, uh, mostly kind of bright and shining uh, up and coming stars. And uh, what we want to do is take what they're doing in the ivory tower and deliver that to the church. Uh, so that uh, the, the people can understand how long, how wide, how deep, and how high is the love of Jesus Christ uh, in a way that they wouldn't had they not put uh, seen these guys in dialogue. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I think that's it, um, to understand uh, both hermeneutics. Uh, so often we come and we look at Paul and we just want to uh, come to any similarities and make it apologetic. And so these guys can't be right. Or some on the other side of the spectrum, they come and say, oh, there's exactly the same. But what we want to do is come in the middle, see the similarities uh, so that we can understand uh, the uniqueness of the gospel, uh, but also how Paul would take these philosophical pop cultural references, if you will, and and uh, baptize them or employ them for the sake of uh, sharing the gospel. Very nice. Good. Paul and the Giants of Philosophy. Uh, it's reading the Apostle in Greco-Roman context. And I certainly want to encourage all of the viewers to uh, buy it. We'll put a link at our uh, website for them to do so, published by InterVarsity Press. A uh, final question for you, Joey. What's next on your right? Okay. So I have some smaller things, but th those are the ma major ones. And, and, I'm looking at four Maccabees in light of Stoicism. Yes, and having multiple projects at the same time. That's always the fun of balancing those projects and interests. So, yep, I know what that's like. I do. Hey, uh, stick on through here. I've got to close out the show, but I'd love to chat with you afterward. All right. Well, that does it for the program today. Um, I am grateful for the continued support uh, that we have uh, from our patrons. Those are folks that just chip in a few bucks each month. Five, ten, twenty dollars. We'd love to get your support. Also, if you love the program, you like the content we're bringing to you, please be sure to give us a review on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Also, review on Facebook as well. You can do that. It's a great opportunity for you to tell people what you think so that way when they discover the program, they can see, hey, what do other people think about this show? Is it something I should download or subscribe to? So please consider doing that. <clears throat> I'm also uh, grateful for the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. They are Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, and Fox Restoration. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris. Oh, Chris, for all the fine work he does, especially today of all days. Thank you so much. I'm glad he's in studio today. Thank you. My extended gratitude. I think I could go on for another five minutes just uh, describing to you how appreciative I am of your work, not just today, but through the years, Chris. Thank you. I want to thank our guests today, uh, Joey Dodson and Dave Briones, uh, for their, uh, their thoughts, their contributions to uh, looking at Paul, trying to understand Paul maybe a little bit better, helping us understand Paul in his time period and contrasting Paul's views with others or seeing how they're similar. It's, it's wonderful for folks to be thinking about that stuff. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.